Hey, yo, what is a cipher? It was like, oh, a moment. You. The knowledge of the cipher is to enlighten you. Where you think the cipher come from? The gods. Because you tried to jump the cipher and it goes this way. <laughs> Welcome to The Cypher. I'm your host, Sean Sotaro. This episode, we talk to photographer, cinematographer, director, sneakerhead, and hip-hop historian Lisa Leone. Lisa began her career as a photographer by taking pictures of her friends. Because this was New York in the early 80s, those friends included some of the world's top graffiti artists and b-boys. She moved from there into photographing hip-hop artists. She has amazing photos of Nas recording Illmatic, Snoop Dogg on the set of his first video, Biggie backstage in an early show, and tons more. All of these can be seen, by the way, in her book and at the exhibit of her photos, which we talk about during the course of the show. Lisa's done lots more fascinating stuff in her life. Uh, Helmed music videos, directed documentaries, and spent years working closely with filmmaking giant Stanley Kubrick. Now, via Skype from her home in Miami, here's Lisa Leone. Welcome to The Cypher here with Lisa Leone, a photographer, filmmaker, cinematographer, jack of all trades. Most recently, she has a great exhibit called Here I Am, photographs of Lisa Leone at the Bronx Museum of the Arts. That's up through January 11th, and uh, I definitely encourage everyone to check it out. So... Uh, it's at the Bronx Museum of the Arts, which is appropriate because you, you were born and you spent, I think, maybe what, the first like 14, 15 years of your life in the Bronx, right? Yeah, I mean, I went back and forth. I was born in the Bronx and, um, you know, my parents separated. So it was more of that going, being back and forth in the Bronx and Queens and then moved to Manhattan when I was about 15. But I still go back to the Bronx. My cousin still lives in the same house that, you know, we were growing up in. So. I'm still there for Christmas and for everything, so still home. Being a young child, at least spending part of your time in the Bronx, what was that like? What were your memories of, of that space? That's kind of a time, this was probably around sort of the, the 70s. 70s, yeah, that it was a time when, you know, at least in the popular imagination, it's like, oh, the Bronx is burning and every building's on fire and stuff like that. I was curious what someone who actually lived there as a child, what your experience was like. I know everybody's always like, oh, my God, the Bronx, you know, I, I I lived in the North Bronx. I didn't live in the South Bronx. So I wasn't part of the whole Bronx is burning section. I don't know. I always have fond memories of, of, of growing up in the Bronx because it was a lot about community. You know, we used to like run outside and be running around to, three in the morning sneaking out of the house or whatever. And then the neighbor would always get you back in or, you know, it was oh, like everyone was looking out for each other. Yeah. There was some rough and rugged times and whatever, but, but, uh, you know, you knew the guys who owned the corner store and it was just more of, like I said, more community. So I have fond memories of it. Were you aware at all of, of stuff happening just to your South as far as like the oh, beginnings yeah. of what would later be called hip hop? Yeah. 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 I mean, this was, yeah, no, I mean, it was before, you know, even hip hop and stuff, but we were definitely aware. We were definitely aware. Um, I used to go down to like where Yankee Stadium and stuff, actually where the Bronx Museum is, you know, in Hunts Point um, and the South Bronx. So you're, you're definitely aware. And it was it was pretty horrifying. It was not a great place because even when I was photographing in the early 80s in the South Bronx, um, it was still rough. I mean, it wasn't fires, but, you know, tons of abandoned lots. And, you know, I would go after school with my boyfriend to go look for his little brother who would always play in abandoned buildings. So crawling through abandoned buildings, looking for Billy, you know, <laughs> so, you know, and it, so it was really crazy. And then it was, then when crack came up, crack was really a game changer. I mean, in the seventies, you know, everybody was on heroin, but heroin's like a mellower drug. So, you know, it wasn't a lot of people. It, it just, the, 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 the vibration of, of cities completely changed with crack because 
of the nature of the drug and what it does to you and what how crackheads are compared to heroin addicts. You know. Yeah. When do you when do you remember crack hitting? I've talked to people about this and it seems like it was almost like instant, like one second it was there, you know, it wasn't yeah. there and then the next second it was. It does feel like that. I remember my first time kind of really actually seeing how bad it was, was I, w I was on like 96th Street around Broadway and there was a bunch of um, these girls over at this car and you know, they weren't like real prostitute prostitutes. So, but I would, you could see something was wrong. And I said to somebody, I was like, what's going on over there? Like, what's up with those girls? And they said, oh, they're crackheads. And, you know, at that point they were just, you know, offering their services for some crack or something. So then I, it started to like hit me like, oh, this is, this is bad news. Like it's now I'm starting to see it everywhere. And then Unfortunately, you had friends and you saw people and then but you would just see crackheads on the street. And yeah, it felt like that. All of a sudden, overnight, it was like because people were doing coke in the 80s and freebasing. But freebasing and crack are two different things, you know, and they give you two different highs. So it was much worse. It was much worse. It was horrible, that drug. Yeah. And uh, and so this was happening probably around the time that you were at, you were at uh, art and design, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It was the early 80s. Yeah. And so what was that school like back then? We've had uh, I don't know if you you were there, or if they were there slightly before you. I think the a lot of the Kangol crew guys were there around yeah. around that time. Was that slightly before you or is that that was slightly before me? Yeah. 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 yeah no, it was really um, every major graffiti artist <laughs> in the city was there. And also dancers, I mean, you know, break dancers. The thing is, is that a lot of break dancers are also really talented artists slash graffiti artists. You know, back then it wasn't so separated like, I am a graffiti artist, I am a rapper. I'm People did multiple things, you know, lots of people rode on trains and also danced or, you know, rode on trains and also rapped or DJed, you know, it was much more fluid like that. Um, but so I had also like Fable and Mr. Wiggles and Doze and... Mayor 139. And I mean, it was so potent at that time. Everybody was trading black books all the time. And you know what a black book is, right? Yeah. Yeah. So for our audience who doesn't know, if you want to tell them. So basically what it is, it's like those art books. They're the hardcover black books. And you would give it to somebody, let's say I'd give it to Doze and he'd say, okay, cool. And then he would keep it for like a week and draw a piece in it. And then he'd give it back to me and then you'd have the dose piece and you'd give it to like mayor and say, all right, can you, here's my black book. And so this went on with everybody and everybody was just trading on black books all the time and putting pieces in there. Or sometimes you would just do a tag or a throw up or something. But yeah, so this was major part of high school. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. And, and for our audience, we should note that this is right at, right at the tail end of what's generally considered the golden age of, of graffiti in New York, which is from, you know, its beginnings in 75 up till about 85, 86. Yeah, this is before like Wild Style and Style Wars came out. Wow. Style Style Wars came out, what, in 83, I think, Yeah. Right? You know, black silver letters and said, crime in the city. The idea of style and competing for the best style is the key to all forms of rocking. For the rap MC, it's rocking the mic. For the B-boys, it's rocking the body and break dancing. Or for writers, rocking the city. I was at the premiere at Style Wars, so I remember. That was, that was fun. Wow, so you knew, uh, you knew Henry and Martha then? Yeah, Henry and I are still very close. I was always close with Henry because we used to go after school. We used to go to Henry's loft in Soho. So, um, and Henry and I are still close to this day. Well, how did you, how did, this is uh, Henry Chalfant, by the way, who's the, the Hi, one sorry. of the directors of, of Style Wars and kind of a legendary documentarian of, of you know, street art. What, uh, how did you, how did you meet them? Henry, like I said, I'm not as, as close with Martha, it's more mm -hmm. Henry. Um, we were in high school and at the time my boyfriend was Mayor 139, who's in Style Wars. And we used to just go to the studio after. So I met him at his studio and then we all, I mean, that was like headquarters. After school, everybody would go there, either Central Park or we'd go to Henry's. So there was always a lot of activity. Henry was always involved. Like if someone went piecing that night and they'd call Henry at four o'clock in the morning and be like, yo, Henry, you got to go 
check it out on, you know, this line or that line. And Henry would get out of bed at four o'clock in the morning, get his camera and go wait at the, um, you know, on the, on the platform to catch it, to photograph it before it got buffed. Wow. And, uh, and so at what point did you start thinking like, Hey, I can be involved in this as a, you know, as a photographer myself. I never thought about it like that, actually. Um, because I majored in photography at art and design and it was a natural progression because I was just photographing friends. And then when style Wars came out and, and wild style and all those movies and fable and wiggles <clears throat> started to blow up and, you know, people were having art shows and they needed photographs. So because I was their friend, they were like, Hey, take pictures. You know, can you take pictures? We're going on tour. We need pictures. So, that's kind of how it started. What was it like seeing, you know, around in sort of the, or the early to mid 80s, seeing this scene that you knew as like you and your friends, you know, blow up their movies. People are going on tour to, into foreign countries. You know, people are, you know, the New York City breakers are appearing on television. Like what, what was that like to experience? It was crazy because it was but I don't think anybody really. We never thought about it like that. This is going to take over the world. <laughs> it was just. <laughs> It was like, oh, a moment, you know, I didn't know. I mean, Russell Simmons is older than I am and those guys are older. I was still in high school. So, I mean, they were luckily they had the, you know, the, the foresight that they can see like, oh, this is major. This can be something I was didn't realize. Like, I thought it was just like local. And then when I finally went a couple of years later, I went to, um, Paris in London and I saw graffiti that looked like my friend's graffiti and then I would see kids breaking and I can see that's Ken Swift's move that's that's Fable's move that's and I I turned around to my friend and I was like oh shit this is huge and and still I'm still kind of like what the hell how did this happen <laughs> so funny yeah I mean it's it's amazing and the the thing about the the you know, dancing, the, the b-boying is that that broke first before the music in a lot of ways, at least in terms of like, you know, popular, the popular imagination. That was kind of like something that made it to the mass media largely before the the music. Uh, what, you know, what was your... Well, you still had Grandmaster Flash, like the message was, you know, and, and you had like Treacherous 3 and, but I guess maybe it wasn't as mainstream. What was the, the, a lot of the writers you were around, the, the graffiti writers, what was that scene like? Well, the, the graffiti writers I was with were, um, well, the crews were, it was basically TVS, rock stars, you know, um, ROC, it was Kel first, Mayor 139, Min 1. Those were like my main, um, it was, uh, it was that duro, all those guys. Scene went to not not um, white scene, black scene, which is funny because now you just hear we just, there's only one scene, but back then there were two scenes. It was serious because you know the goal was always to be all city, right? To you know get your tag on every line in every borough, and there were always graffiti wars. Like you know, I remember cap coming to school with a gun and trying to like shoot carlos and you know so whoa, it, whoa, whoa, sorry back up on that for a second <laughs> what's, what's this, trying to shoot him for for going over him or something like some like graffiti war thing well cap went over everybody i am not a graffiti artist i'm a graffiti bomber it's just two styles of graffiti that are trying to you know coexist with each other but it ain't gonna work like that that's why graffiti's ruined like Cap ruined the twos and fives. Now you go to the two yard, it's, it's all destroyed. This guy named Cap with his Lucio Ball hairdo. <laughs> all your burners. So, you know, I don't, you know, all I know is I was sitting in class and my friend Danny, who wrote uh, Eco, E-K-O, was, um, he was trying to get me out of class that he told me, it was like, Mayor got shot. And I was like, what? And then at that, the school bell rang, ran downstairs. And then I see Carlos in the corner, like, shaking i was like oh okay he didn't get shot but somebody was trying to shoot him but who knows you know mayor and, and kel were brothers and maybe it was something kel did and they were trying to reality re who knows i don't even remember what but there was so many stories like that with graffiti writers like one time we were chased down the block by a1 with a sock of batteries because that was a big thing back then where that was a big <laughs> you would like <laughs> 
a bat, you would put a bunch of like D batteries because, you know, from a boom box, you just take the batteries out you, and in a sock. And all of a sudden that became a very serious weapon. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Incredible. And so some, somewhere in the middle of all this, you start, you know, you, you have your camera, you're, you're documenting this stuff. You're in a scene like this, you're at a studio or, or someone's painting or you're at an exhibition. How do you take a picture and try to get, you know, a, a notable picture without sort of interfering in the scene? That seems to be in, in so many of your pictures, you know, they, they feel intimate, but it, it doesn't feel like a portrait exactly. Hmm. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, Snoop, Snoop actually had the same comment. He was kind of like, whoa. Um, I think that, you know, being part of something also, it was, you know, I also used cameras that were pretty small, so they weren't intrusive cameras. I, you know, it was more of, of, of like me seeing moments or feeling moments and then just going and capturing that moment. I'm, I wouldn't shoot like a crazy person, like, you know, it was like I'd pick up the camera, I'd shoot a frame, and then I'd put it down. You mentioned Snoop a second ago, and you have, and we'll we'll have this on, you know, thecyphershow.com. We'll have we'll have some of your your shots. That your portrait of Snoop, which is at his first video. Oh. That uh, Fab Five Freddy directed, a, a great right. friend of the show. It's it's this incredible portrait of him, and he just looks so young. And so kind of like, what what goes through your mind when you see that photo now? I'm just like, well, you know, when I first, you know, dug it up out of the files, I saw Snoop and I brought the, you know, from that session, I brought all those slides to him. And he was, he just couldn't believe the um, intimacy. I look at it and I think, oh my God, he's so young and and vulnerable in a way, you know, is so open and ready to like take everything on. But he was very shy back then. So when he looked at the pictures, he was, he was like, I don't even know how you got this. He said, you know, if you see any pictures of me at that time, I was so guarded and, you know, so not, you know, I, I was so shy and not wanting to people to really see me. So I was like, well, I guess it was part of the, um, you know, again, I was there with Fab hanging out. You know, he was laughing because he was like, you you have like hip hop in your blood. You're a part because there's no way you could have gotten this shot and not been like down. So I just <laughs> laughed. I was like, all right, well, you know. Um, but again, you know, it's like it's, it's, it's a non-intrusive thing. It's not trying to be in people's faces all the time. It's just, you know, being in tune with, with what's happening and then picking your moments decisively yeah being more discerning you know you have a lot of you know a lot of stuff with fab you have in the in the exhibit there's a great portrait of him in a hotel room and where is it paris or something somewhere overseas right yeah we were in paris that was when um we had like two assignments he was directing the uh guru and mc solar video it's the good And I was also there doing a story with him on French hip hop for Vibe. Wow. So that was like basically probably what happened. Cause again, I don't really remember, but, but what would be typical is, you know, I would, we, it would be call time or we'd have to like go in the van to go to the location or whatever. And I probably went to his room to get him and he wasn't ready and he was on the phone. And so I just shot. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, it's really amazing. I mean, there there's so many photos, you know, we could go through all of them, but I, I just want to pick one or two more from the exhibit to talk about. Uh, there's one of Slick Rick in from 92 uh, when he's he's actually in jail. In March of 1991, rapper Slick Rick was convicted of attempted murder in the second degree and weapons possession. He was later sentenced to serve three and a third to 10 years in a New York State penitentiary for shooting at his cousin and one time bodyguard, Mark Plummer, and injuring an innocent bystander. Rick, who yeah, was at Rikers Island. Yeah. yeah. What he just, you know, it, it's a pretty haunting photo. I don't want to read too much into it. How did, first of all, how'd you get in there? And uh, and what was that? What kind of mood was he in? You know, what was that day like? I actually went um, with Russell, 
to Rikers and Russell was going to meet with him. Actually, his album was going to come out soon. And um, so we went to, I just, you know, went along with them. We were going to do something for Vibe magazine about it. Um, so I went and he was happy, like, to see Russell, like, you know, when you have a visitor, obviously. But at the same time, there's that which is captured in the picture, I think, that kind of feeling of, like, what the fuck, why am I in here? <laughs> like, yeah. like, you know, it's it sucks, you know. It was not a good situation. His album was coming out. He was, you know, and here he was locked up. So, you know, I can't, he was really sweet and and nice and, you know, not, didn't have, like, a front at all of being, you know, uh nasty or yeah he just was he was cool but but you can see it's fucked up yeah yeah it's, he, he what you know again i didn't want to breed into it but hearing that yeah he definitely does look very sad and i think you you captured that really well i mean he's had he's a legend but in a lot of ways his career has been a little derailed by forces you know yeah sort of somewhat beyond his control and I was a huge Slick Rick fan also. So on top of it, for me, when they were, I was like, oh, my God, I love Slick Rick. So, you know, to like the only time I met him or photographed him was in prison. Yeah, that's 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 crazy. I think one other photo, you know, we talk about Snoop and you think like, OK, he did that video. And then that album, the the first album just went into the stratosphere. And there's another like right on the cusp photo you have of the Fugees at the video shoot for Vocab. Right. And, you know, that was on the the first album. I think it was actually like the remix for that that really launched them, you know, began to launch them. And then, you know, obviously the the second album, you know, 10 million copies, they're superstars. Um, what was it like to, you know, what were they like? Did you have any inkling that like, OK, this is a group that's going to be, you know, out of here you know it was it was again it was like mad cool vibe you know we were up in east harlem all day and shooting um that one was on a rooftop but we were also in the street and all over and uh max malkin who's a great director was the was directing and you know he's such a cool guy so you know the director sets the tone also on a set so it was it was just um, like, and you can see in the book, there's more photos from that shoot. Also, by the way, there's a book. Everyone could go buy it. It's at the Strand in New York City. No. <laughs> um, and, at the, and at the museum. And at the museum, yes. And on minormattersbooks.com. Yeah. Um, they were just really mellow and cool and exactly what you would expect. I don't know if I, I, I really dug them, so I was hoping they would blow up. You know, I'm not, I was never good at that. Like, oh, this person's, I would not make a good A&R person. Let's put it that way. No, because there's a lot of people that I was like, oh, they'll never make it. And they became huge. And people, I'm like, this is going to make it. And then they die out. So I was never good at that. But I definitely knew that I was into the Fugees and, and what they were doing. You've caught a bunch of people on the cusp. You know, you have a great picture of Mary J. Blige before anyone knew who she was. Yeah, yeah. And then I have pictures which I haven't shown yet, even at the, I was on the Big Papa video. You know, that whole time also with Biggie, Big Papa, like totally. Yeah, you, you, do, have, you do have one shot of Biggie in the, in the exhibit when he's kind of right. backstage at a right. show. Right, it's not from that, sh not, it's a, that's a different time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think that was maybe a, a couple of years later, sort of after after he'd blown up. Yeah. And so one other. Oh, so there's one there's a picture of Debbie Mazur. Now, not even that picture in particular, but she has quite the sort of hip hop history that most people don't know about. If they only know her as an actress, they know her as I know, you know an entourage, whatever. But she's very serious, like, you know, hip hop personality. A big time. I mean, I first met Debbie when I was 16 and I was going out with Mayor. And she was going out with Kel first and they were brothers. And so we became, you know, 
great friends because, well, you know, she went out with Kel for like eight years and I was with Mayor for like five years. So, and the first time I met her was at the Roxy, which was, you know, religiously, we were all there Friday night. And I, she had melon green uh, pumas, I mean, um, green suede pumas with melon fat laces. She had like blonde Barbie doll hair cut. She had, you know, the silver nameplate that Kel designed for her with Deb and Wild Style. You know, she was, she was in Graffiti Rock. You know that first show with Michael Holman. Yeah, Mike, Michael's Michael's been a guest on the show. We we yeah. love we love him and and Graffiti yeah. Rock definitely. So I mean, she was. I mean, you know, Debbie's been down from the beginning because she's also she was down in the New York club scene, the Mud Club, and all that stuff. You know, it was also a time where like downtown meets uptown. And, you know, Keith Haring was around and, and, you know, all of these heads. So it was an amazing, potent time in, uh, in New York City. And, and so, yeah, she was totally, her and I used to go sit on platforms waiting for like Kel and Mayer's trains to go by or, so yeah, she was definitely part of the beginnings of hip hop. Yeah, and that that kind of like uptown meets downtown has been somewhat of an accidental theme of of this show. We've talked to a lot of people who were around for that that crossbreeding where, you know, you had, you know, Debbie Mazer and, you know, Madonna and, you know, lots of sort of people maybe associated with downtown cross-pollinating with, you know, folks from uptown, the flashes and so forth. Oh, yeah, no, I remember, like, at the Roxy Madonna dancing with, like, Cowboy from, from the Furious Five. You know what I mean? It was like, that's just, you know, and then on the other corner, there's, like, Rocksteady battling some crew or war. You know, it was just, like, an amazing, amazing time. You know, one of the other really incredible times that isn't well documented, but that is is in your show, is the making of Illmatic. Uh, uh, you you yeah. were in the studio for that. Yeah. 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 I mean, and, and the crazy thing is you've, you've said in interviews and stuff, you're like, well, I didn't even, I found these pictures. I just kind of forgot I was there, which. Oh, I forgot. I know. <laughs> I know people are like, what? <laughs> right. You, you forgot you were at the painting of the Sistine Chapel. Like. <laughs> yeah, it was 20 years ago. You know? yeah. I remember being there and I remember having conversations and I remember the day. Yeah. I remember that. Nas was upset with the record company about something. I remember feeling that he was so young and saying to him, like, if you don't want to do something, you know, like, don't do it and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I was like getting, I felt like protective, <laughs> you know, even though I didn't know him, but I was just, he was this like young, obviously crazy talented kid. And, you know, I've seen how record companies could be already by that point. So I was like, do, do what you want to do and blah, blah, blah. It was like a moment. I'm sure like he would never remember that. But it's like I, I'm just saying how clear I remember the day. But I couldn't until I saw the pictures of the day again. I, I didn't remember. Yeah. Yeah. And there are some great shots in there uh, of of Nas and Primo and Q-Tip and Large Professor. Yeah. Uh, just and and, you know, all four of them together. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was amazing. It was amazing. It was very mellow. It was very, I mean, it took a long time to make that album, right? So it was, it was a very cool, I'm, I was glad that I was there. I can't believe how, I am actually haven't even seen the movie yet. I'm going tonight. It's finally in Miami. So I'm going to go see Time Zomatic, which my photographs are in. I haven't, but I haven't seen the film yet. I'm excited. Yeah, it's a, it's a great movie. Uh, and one final, you know, we'll move on to all other stuff you've done, but I did want to ask about one one more shot, which is the one from the I Want to Be Down remix shoot. So MC Light, Yo-Yo, Brandy, and Queen Latifah. And both in the video and in your photos, I rewatched the video last night, um... They actually, I'm just curious what that set was like, because they look like they're having a good time and kind of clowning around. They were. It was totally relaxed. It wasn't, it was, it was great. It was a great vibe. It was like girl power, you know, Hype, Hype directed it, Hype Williams and Malik Saeed shot it. And, um, 
So, you know, it was a very cool vibe. The girls were great. They were totally goofing around on each other and laughing and yeah, there was it was there was no like diva bullshit or anything if that's what you're asking. <laughs> no, not not in particular. It's just, you know, what what the whole thing was like, you know. Yeah, no, it was just it was nice. It was shot in like a huge studio. You can see it was like a backdrop. It was very glamour. You know, the lighting was really superb. Malik is an amazing DP. And um, and it was just really, you know, jo um, really a lot of upbeat, high energy, you know, but good energy. You know, there's not. Um, I guess that's all I can really say about it. Yeah. It was like it was like a cool vibe to be on, like a cool set to be on. Nice. And so all the the pictures in the exhibition, you know, there are a few from kind of your, you know, I think probably post high school years but they mostly cluster from like 1990 through kind of the middle of that decade. Uh, what, what happened after that period that kind of moved you away from documenting hip hop, at least kind of photographically? I started working. Well, I actually started, um, I became a cinematographer. So I was still documenting hip hop, but I was shooting like music videos. So I was, I moved towards the moving camera instead of the still camera. And I was still photographing some stuff, but, and then I had a really bad experience. It was horrible. I was shooting a TLC video in Atlanta and I had my, my camera bag in the camera truck, all my Leicas and everything. Cause I still traveled with all my cameras because I still want to take pictures and someone stole my camera bag out of the truck. Oh man. Yeah, it was bad. So it took me a while to get those cameras back as far as getting insurance and buying new cameras. But that was kind of devastating to me because, I mean, first of all, it was two Leicas and a bunch of lenses. So you can imagine the money. It was very expensive. And, and that was that was a downer. So but I kept shooting music videos and then I started working with Stanley Kubrick. And so by like 1996, I I was completely absorbed in Kubrick world and and just you know wasn't around. I didn't have time. I was working on Eyes Wide Shut with him for four years. You started out just doing you know research shots for him, right? Someone who was working on the film said, "Oh, take pictures of this or that area of New York no, City." No, it's actually his daughter Vivian and I were friends, and she said, "Look, can you do me a huge favor? I can't tell my father." But he wants me to photograph all this stuff, but I'm moving across country and I can't pay you, but I can buy you film. Um, can you just take this list and help me? So I, she's a friend of mine. I never saw anything out of it. And I said, yeah, sure. So I like took pictures and then she sent it to him and he was like, well, these are like some of the best research pictures I've seen. He's And she's well, I got to be honest, I didn't take them. <laughs> <laughs> She said, my friend Lisa did, you know, I'm moving, I'm moving to California. I didn't have time. So he was like, all right, great. Ask her if she wants a couple of weeks of work. And then a couple of weeks turned into four years, basically. You know, I mean, we spent a year on the phone every day, three times a day. And then finally he was like, why don't you just come to London while we're shooting? Because I was doing all the research stuff. So... You know, he's also from the Bronx, from the neighborhood that my parents are from. So it was like, I don't know, there was just an immediate, comfortable, we kind of like, it was easy to, to talk to him. Plus, it was Vivian's dad. Like, I wasn't thinking of it like, oh, my God, it's Stanley Kubrick. I was like, oh, it's Vivian's father. I, I, I was going to ask about that. To what extent did you have to, like, keep in your head, you know, try to divorce yourself from, oh, my God, this is the guy who made 2001. This is the guy who made Clockwork Orange. And just be like, okay, this is not, like, Stanley Kubrick in quotes. It's, like, just the guy I'm on the phone with. Right, exactly. I mean, again, it would help that Vivian and I were such good friends because I was, like, at the end of the day, I'm like, oh, it's her dad. You know, they were very close. And then the three of us would just hang out together. And, you know, Stanley's really warm. I know everybody has all those stories about Stanley, but he's really funny and really warm and really witty. And, you know, all of that, as long as you work hard and you're into what you're doing, you know, he's great. He's so generous with, you know, if I ask him, like, what's that light or what is this or how did the dailies look or whatever, he's so open to talking to you about it or teaching you or whatever. So it was pretty fast, that whole, like, oh, my God, it's Stanley Kubrick, 
you know, guard down. Because once you're, and then when you're talking to somebody and you're not seeing their face mm -hmm. for a year, it's really kind of puts your guard down because you're just on the phone. So it's not, you know, you don't have that intimidation of someone staring at you a certain way or whatever. So, um, yeah, we would joke around a lot. So, so you actually worked with him like one on one very closely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing is also on Stanley's sets, they're really small. So, you know, it's like working on a student film. No, we were like, you know, at the end of the day, it turned out to be the only person from New York that worked on the film. So it was like we were constantly, I mean, there was started to be a joke on set where, you know, his estate was called Chittabri, where he lived. And they were like, so I hear that they're redecorating a room. You're, oh, they're changing the wallpaper in, in your room in Chittabri. Like, you know, that I was like moving in because we were we were very, very close. I mean, we were extremely close. Wow. And what is what is the thing about him that people would be surprised to know? I guess how funny he is, <laughs> you know, he's, and I mean, I would imagine that everyone know how witty he is and also how, um, how open, I mean, obviously everyone knows the stories about like what a hard worker he is. And then he does a hunt, you know, all these takes and does all, you know, he's, everything is dedicated to the film and so on and so forth. But he was also very open to suggestions about like, the film or like I always felt very comfortable with like well what about this what should we try this lighting or what, what is this like or maybe you know how open he was on top of it he wasn't like um and I think one of the biggest things that I've learned is that when the first time we were like in one of the locations and he was like how are we gonna light this and you know I was like well maybe like this and this and, you know everyone was chipping in whatever and he was so it was so comforting to see someone like Stanley Kubrick say, I don't know. Like you'd ask him, like, what how are we gonna do this? Or what are you gonna and he'd say, I don't know. I don't know. And I was like, because working on sets with him up until then, as a DP, it was kind of like, you're not allowed as a DP to say, I don't know, because you know, you have to know everything and where the people are gonna get nervous. And I was like, no. You know, as an artist, you you may not know. It's, you'll get to it, and it's going to come through. But it was so freeing to just hear those words from Stanley Kubrick because you're like, well, if he doesn't know, then shit. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, one one thing, you know, he has a, a reputation of the popular imagination as this, like, crazy perfectionist. He was an obsessive perfectionist, notorious for the demands he made on his actors. He'd sometimes be made to play a scene more than 50 times before he was satisfied. How how true is that, really? He's pretty much a perfectionist. <laughs> He's definitely a perfectionist. I mean, like, he'd want to reshoot something even if the acting was on point. He'd want to reshoot it because the frame might have been, like, a half an inch off. Especially when it came to, like, the imagery because, you know, his background's as a photographer and he's got such strong sense of composition and imagery. So he was definitely a perfectionist, mm -hmm. I would say. I mean, I, uh, you know, just to do the second unit shots, I've walked for two winters in a row, like every day and sending pictures back and forth. And we would discuss, I'd have one set and he'd have another set. And we'd sit on the phone for hours discussing like, all right, look at shot 32C. That looks pretty good, but maybe go back and pan left a little and, tilt up a tiny bit and so it was like and this is just for the establishing shot which is what on for like two seconds you know so we finally got like the establishing shots and tons of photos I mean I took so many pictures of uh, the city I mean books and books and books and books and books so yeah so eyes wide shut was the was the version that was released was that how close was that? Because he passed where at some point during that process, he he passed. Right. Or was it after the film was completed? Basically, what happened is that on Thursday, Warner Brothers, Tom and Nicole saw that cut. It was the first cut he showed anybody. Mm -hmm. And then on Saturday, he died. So it was a shock, obviously. And so when I heard he died, I, you know, flew immediately to London, stayed at the house and helped 
prepped a funeral and stuff. And it was decided then there was a little meeting with Terry Semmel, who was the head of Warner Brothers at the time, and and Jan Harlan, who was his brother-in-law and executive producer, and Leon Vitali. You know, a bunch of us got together who were, you know, very closely involved in the film and decided, okay, well, we can't touch it. It's done. So my feeling is that there'd probably be some more editing or some little bit of tweaks here and there. I don't know how much, you know, the editor would know because they might have talked about stuff. But there was definitely a meeting and a decision to say, all right, well, this is it no matter what. Even if we know if you wanted to do other things, we can't touch it because who? Who's going to be the final word to say? I always thought it should be Vivian, his daughter, because she was the closest in a working relationship, like creatively. Like he, she was, she's like a genius herself. So, um, but, so that's what happened. Wow. That's, and uh, I know you've, you've, since then, you know, done some panels speaking about him and speaking about, you know, your relationship with him and your work on Oswald Shut. Dealing with like the stuff around Kubrick, the the conferences and the fans and the articles and stuff like that. What was that like after having such a kind of personal relationship with him? It just makes me smile because it's like like that film that just came out. What was it called? Room two forty two or two o two or two thirty seven or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Like that, I was like, oh my god, Leon, who is. Stanley's assistant for 30 years. Leon and I are still friends. And so we talk about those kind of things all the time. And we just crack up because we, it's just like he was so misunderstood. You know, it's like people read so much into stuff that really not that much. Not that, you know, it's not to the extent that people do, that people think. Um, so it just makes me smile and and think like, wow, you know, people have this perception of the man that, you know, I don't I don't know if it's really that's the man that they think, you know. Yeah. You know, other than Kubrick, a somewhat mercurial, another somewhat, you know, mercurial and mysterious figure you've worked with a little bit has been Rakim. You shot the the you were involved in that video for classic, right? The the song I was on the video for classic and then which was even better was I um me and my friend Matt Levy um got together and created an idea I helped him with the idea, and then he went and wrote it about a, a, a film called Once Upon a Rhyme. And for me, it was like kind of, we kind of mixed all these different hip hop stories, but it was like a, a story, a hip hop story from that, w that would have taken place like in the 80s or whatever. So we wanted Rakim to play the lead. And we met with Rakim and we actually were like, you know, some investors and people that were interested in it were like, all right, cool, but can he act? So it was amazing. I spent a day with Rakim in, in, in like an acting studio and going through um, the script and doing rehearsals and, and doing uh, like a little, you know, screen tests and stuff. But we played because I wanted to see how much he can you know, stretch himself and how well he took direction in acting and stuff. So that was really the highlight because Rakim, Rakim has always been my favorite. So, and I never shot him like back in the early days. Yeah. What? So what's the status of that uh, that project? I don't know. You know, it's like, it's it's just, we've been having trouble finding investors for it. So if anybody out there, Rakim is down. So, yeah. And so the, the, the classic video shoot, for people who remember that song, it was, you know, a sort of Nike ad slash song with uh, Rakim and Nas and KRS and Kanye. In the fresh pair, Air Force One sneakers, uptown, we call them uppies when they on deep. Probably one with KRS One teachers, Nas made you look before the heaters. I bet your car had them on when he walked with Jesus. Jesus classic. Produced by Premiere, and you had a long form video for it, probably, you know, but five or six minute video that opens with Premiere sort of creating the beat and there's, you know, graffiti artists and stuff. Um, first of all, were all five of those people ever on set at the same time? No, nope. No, that was, it was all done separately. It was all done. No, that's not true. Premiere and, and Rakim were together. Mm -hmm. 
But that was it. That was it. We didn't. Um, Kanye, I think, sent us video. I don't think we even shot Kanye. Crazy. And so what was it like making that, putting that together with, you know, where where it, there's a certain amount of expectation, right? You have like five legendary people. So when they do something, it's got to be like, you know, the greatest thing ever. Like, did, did you feel any of that pressure? Like, what was it like putting that that video together? Well, it was a funny situation because of the people's schedules. It was difficult to get everybody. So I actually wound up shooting because Tebow, who directed it, also was um, we co-directed just for kicks, the documentary on sneakers. So I was like I wasn't available for all the times that they they needed. So I shot Rakim and Primo, but I didn't shoot um, Kanye. They sent the Kanye video. uh, So no one shot Kanye. And I didn't shoot the KRS and the um, Nas and Nas yeah, part. Yeah. So those two. So it was like a bash up of all of it, you know. Um, so Tebow shot the rest of it. I mean, directed it. I don't. I don't remember who shot those other two pieces. So yeah. So I was only with Rakim and, and Premier, which for me is, you know, that was that was a major part of the video and the and the graffiti. I shot the graffiti stuff. Yeah, that was great. The sort of interstitial graffiti stuff. Yeah. Right. I shot that too. That was, was, oh my God, it was like 30 below that day. And we, and then, and then the, the cans kept freezing. Like we couldn't, like they'd go to spray and then it was so cold. Like they couldn't get the paint out. And everyone, if you look at the video, you'll see like, you know, mad frost coming out of everyone's mouth. This pig Joe Conzo came and took pictures and there's pictures of Tebow and I in like giant down coats and because, you know, we had to be out there all day. So it was like, oh, my God, it was kind of a nightmare in that respect. But then it was cool. And then Rakim came. Then, um, yeah, Rakim came also at the end of the day. He was supposed to come in the daytime mm-hmm. where, on the rooftop to where the graffiti artists were. And he didn't show up until night. And I didn't have any lights and we had to shoot on the roof because we didn't, there was nothing else there. It wasn't like there was another studio because it was another day. And so I just took like a clamp light <laughs> that was like <laughs> on some office floor. And I was like, plug this in. We'll just use this. So <laughs> yeah, it was kind of crazy shoot. But the, the studio portion was a lot more controlled and, and, and flowed easily. And again, like great vibes because, you know, you got premiere and Rakim it was like oh my god it was such a highlight for me I was very excited about that speaking of vibes you actually worked at the magazine vibe for a while writing their their shoot column and so you know obviously the magazine just announced that they're shutting down their print edition and so in in light of that I wanted to ask you about your time there because you were there sort of during its its heyday yeah what happened was is that I had come back from the Snoop video and there was like a little bit of a shootout <laughs> happening after we after they did the VIP like on top of the record on top of that record um, store we all were going to another location which was this giant park in Long Beach and um, all of a sudden I heard helicopters and cops and people were running and a gunshot and Fab was like oh shit let's go and I was kind of shooting as we're running and Fab was like come on what are you doing? We're going to get shot. And I, he's like, put the camera away. And at the time, Fab didn't even drive. So we hopped into my rental car. And then I just kind of got out of the parking lot, speeded out of the parking lot. And then like a couple of weeks later, they did the, the um, you know, they, they had the uh, video to continue, but on set this time, obviously, with a lot of security. And it was so funny because when I saw Snoop, he was like, wait a minute, were you the one driving Fred from the park? And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, you cut you cut me and sugar off. <laughs> <laughs> and I started cracking up and it really made me feel like, because I never, it was like my first kind of introduction into like LA gang culture and stuff. And I just thought, and you know, in New York, no one drives and you know, so I just thought, wow, they're so like, aware of like who's driving and what's driving and what you know it's like this such a different culture 
in yet another thing you did that's that's incredibly notable is just for kicks kind of the definitive documentary about sneakerheads sneaker culture we go out we see a shoe and we say to ourselves like all right the 97 came out you know do you like that that's pretty dope you know what i'm copping three pairs of that sneaker like you guys were filming that one kid with the camera on pink and uh some guy was asking me what are you guys doing I was like, oh, it's a movie on sneakers, and he didn't concept. He was like, I don't, what do you mean? How, how much did you know about sneakers, about that lifestyle, that culture, before making the film, co-directing that film? Well, what happened was Tebow, who co-directed it with me, he, we, well, I should go back, because I met Tebow with Fab in Paris when we went for that Paris trip that time, where, where he's in his bathrobe. Who was yeah. that time? Tebow was, um... Uh, Fab's assistant in Paris and we were like oh my god he's amazing he like spoke English with no accent he was like an encyclopedia on hip hop history and knowledge and we like fell in love with him and we started joking around and we're like that's our son if we had a son it would be Tebow <laughs> so, <laughs> so we'd always be like have you heard from our son and blah blah blah, blah. and we just I mean we're still in contact him and Tebow and his family would just at my house for like a week this summer from Paris uh, vacationing. So Tebow always stayed in touch and whenever he'd come to New York, we'd hang out with him. And then he came to me and he said, hey, I want to do this sneaker documentary. Do you want to do it for me? He never directed a film before. So he was like, you know, you've directed films and done stuff. Canal Plus, you know, the French television station gave them the okay, but, you know, he's not a director. So like... So they they were he was like, Do you want to do it with me? I said I said, Look, you know I know about sneakers up until like the nineties. Because I was a total sneakerhead, but it was like in the seventies and eighties. I said, So I can, you know, I can like take care of the early part and you take <laughs> care of the later part, and then in the edit room we'll like put it together. So, you know, that's when I called like Doe's and, and Grandmaster Kaz and all those guys to be interviewed, Fab, you know, about it. And then he kind of, you know, the Jordan and, and all that kind of stuff. I was, you know, I didn't know anything about that. So he kind of got that. And then we went in the edit room in Paris and kind of put it together as a story together, you know. Yeah. And so uh, what's what is your favorite sneaker? Ha! Huh. It switches sometimes, but... My favorite sneaker, which, you know, I kicked myself because when we were shooting and we were shooting a store in Philadelphia, I found it again. It was like in some dusty shoe box and the guy sold it to me for forty five dollars. And I was like, I still tell Tebow, like, why didn't you tell me to buy more of them You know, <laughs> for forty five dollars? Are you kidding? But it was a. Um, there was two favorite. I, I was when I was in high school. My favorite one was the Nike Cortez with the red stripe, mm -hmm. and um, I used to have my my red and white fat checker laces that would match. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, these other ones we found in Philly were also a Nike, but they're God. I don't know, he's going to kill me that I can't remember the name. They came out in like a, they're gold. They're all gold. They have them in silver. They came back out with the silver ones, but never the gold ones. Oh, sorry. I can't remember. I can see what they look like in my mind. I have them, but I'm so afraid to wear them. I like never wear them because I don't want to mess them up because I only have one pair. And then I also have a pair of hard shell Adidas that I love, but they're silver, like silver hard shell, which I also found in like some place in Silver Lake in, in L.A. on like a dusty shelf. Wow. They have so so dust, dusty shelves are apparently the place to go sneaker shop. Yeah, I still kind of, that's still kind of the move, yeah. Yes. I mean, I don't know if there's any more of those dusty kind of places, but this was like a shoemaker. And I went in there and I was like, oh, my God, you have some old sneakers in here. So it's always fun when you find those places. Because when I was in high school, you always, you know, you went to Juman or you were up in Harlem all the time. Like this was a fun activity that we were very involved in. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, one other one other project before we catch up to, to what you're doing now, uh, one kind of project, more recent one that I, I wanted to ask you about. Um, I saw this crazy short film you made of uh, Marissa Tomei, who, by the way, looks barely a day older than she did on A Different World back in, back in like the late 80s. Hula hooping. Mm hmm. 
Marissa and I, Marissa's like one of my closest friends. She's like my sister. And she were, got in, really got into hula hooping when she was training for the wrestler. She had all these different kind of, you know, training techniques she was doing. And one was hula hooping. And she fell in love with it. And then they offered, somebody offered her uh, to do a DVD, like a, like a exercise hula hooping video. So she was like, were you directed? So I wound up directing the video and we were very adamant with the company that we felt like we needed to do like a short little piece that would be fun, that could be viral. And they didn't want to support it at all. They were like, what, why, what's the point? And they didn't get it. So Marissa and I were like, well, fine, we'll just go out and shoot it ourselves. And so that little video you're referring to is us and like her assistant and me and a sound guy running around LA for two days where she would like change from the car. I'd be like, all right, we're going to another location, change in the car. And then we'd run out somewhere and just like shoot it or go to our friend's house or go here. And then our friend Jen um, edited it and we used the music from our friend Fits in the Tantrum. So we, it was like really a homegrown kind of thing. And then the, the company still didn't get it. They were like, why would we put this on? And we're like, oh man, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, it is out there to be seen. So I definitely recommend uh, people, you know, search it and, and, yeah, and find it. It's on my it. website actually, I think. So yeah, it's fun. So bringing it up, up to date, what are you, uh, what are you working on right now? What are you up to? Two projects. One, on the photography front, I've been working on a new series, Photographing Women, which is more of like portraits, but more of like really feeling the essence of, of a particular woman and who they are and not so much, and, and kind of capturing the beauty, but not in the typical societal beauty where it's like hair and makeup and airbrushing and blah, blah, blah. So again, you know, still very naturalistic and raw kind of images. So I've been working on that and, um, and also been developing a feature film, which I'm planning to direct. Wow. And anything you can tell us about it or you don't want to jinx it? No, it's just a story about, um, a girl who grows up in the Bronx, <laughs> <laughs> but nothing to do with hip hop. It's really about, um, you know, I'm I'm always going to place a story or something in the Bronx or New York because that's, for me, I love shooting in those, you know, environments, the textures. It's where I'm, where I consider home, even though I'm not living there, you know. So if I'm imagining anything, a lot of times it'll go back to that. But it's just like a woman who is, it's kind of a kind of tragic comedy, I'd say, you know, like in the the vein of those old Italian neo-realist films where it's like funny and then you're like, oh, that's not that funny. So I'm about a girl growing, um, going back home after she's been gone for a while and, and kind of discovering why she's been having trouble with um, commitment in all sense of the word. So reflecting back to, to her family who are the crazy Italians from the Bronx. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. Lisa Leone, definitely go, you know, get her book uh, and check out the exhibit. Here I am, photographs of Lisa Leone at the Bronx Museum of the Arts. Again, that's through January 11th. Just incredible, incredible photos, just really intimate moments of just classic, classic stuff. Uh, so thank you so much for, for sharing so much of your story with us, Lisa. We re I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. It's been great. Thanks a lot. So as you can tell in this interview, uh, Lisa has had a, an amazing life. Uh, she's just done so much stuff, and it was great to talk to her about it. This episode continues the Cypher's kind of accidental theme of 1980s New York uh, when downtown met uptown and hip hop really got going. Uh, we talk about that with Michael Holman in episode 45. We talk about that with MC Search from Third Base and uh, Keo, the original white rapper in episode 55. And we discuss it with Grand Mixer DXT in episode 68. Uh, we keep coming back to a bunch of things, uh, including Debbie Mazur. Uh, Debbie, if you're listening, uh, you keep coming up over and over again, and we'd love to have you on the show. 
That period of time is just so fascinating uh, for me personally and obviously for a lot of our guests. This is a different take from someone who was certainly at all the right places at all the right times. So much of what Lisa did was interesting, uh, particularly her directing work, but I was really glad that we got to spend so much time talking about her relationship with Stanley Kubrick. I mean, who expects to listen to a hip hop podcast and hear 10 minutes about the making of Eyes Wide Shut? You really, you really get a picture from listening to Lisa talk about what kind of person Kubrick actually was. And he's so kind of mysterious and mercurial and, and hidden behind so many layers so much of the time. Uh, it was really great to get that. And I really hope that that movie she's planning with Rakem gets made someday. Any rich folks out there listening who want to get into the movie business, uh, you now know who to call. The most important part of the cipher is you. Make sure to find us on iTunes and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. While you're there, leave us a review. The more five-star reviews we get, the better chance we have of continuing to get amazing guests. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at The Cypher Show. Hit me up there with your ideas for future guests, what you thought of the show, anything you'd want to talk about. Join us next week when we talk to author Brian Coleman. Coleman has three books of what he calls invisible liner notes of classic hip hop albums. The latest edition, Check the Technique Volume 2, just came out. If you haven't read these books, uh, stop what you're doing and pick them up now. They are behind the scenes accounts, uh, blow by blow of how some of the greatest hip hop records of all time got made. The book breaks down albums from people like Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, the Gravediggers, Ice Cube, KMD, and from groups who have been guests on the show, including uh, Black Star, Company Flow, The Coup, and Third Base. Brian conducted interviews with basically everyone involved in making these records, and the results are phenomenal. He has a history of the group, making of the record, and track-by-track track breakdowns. No less a hip-hop authority than Chuck D calls the books a fantastic guide for all we do. So join us next week for the man behind Check the Technique, Brian Coleman. The Cypher is created and written by Sean Sotaro. Canal Plus, you know, the French television station gave them the okay. The show is produced and engineered by Josh Cross at Crosstown Studios. Chased down the block by A1 with a sock of batteries. Our website, the newly redesigned thecyphershow.com, is created by Paul Dice. Even if we know if you wanted to do other things, we can't touch it. Our music is by 42 Ghosts. That's our son. And we'll see you around on The Cypher. I didn't realize it was like a class trip with five other people, so it was impossible.